Thanks for coming to Arista. I'll give you a brief overview of who we are, what we do. All of you are fairly technical, so this will go very, very fast. Um, when you look at cloud networking and the space we are in, building data center networks, we've come a long way over the last five years. We've gone from very hierarchical designs and so on to two-tier designs, or even one-tier designs, and these scale beautifully. We've gone from uh, sort of very hierarchical oversubscribed designs to now a single flat one-tier design, we call it the spline, that connects up to 2,000 hosts with a pair of switches, non-blocking. It's great for many clusters, many enterprises, many customers already do this. It's great for storage uh, clusters as well. Then on the two-tier designs with our leaf spine, it could be layer two using LACP, which is the MLAC design, or it could be layer three ECMP using OSPF or BGP. The layer two designs scale to roughly 10,000 physical machines connected together at 10 gig. The layer three designs scale to a massive number. We have deployed what may be amongst the largest cluster in the world with these designs, roughly 220,000 servers in a single cluster using layer three ECMP, which is 64-way wide. And, and we already support up to 128-way ECMP today, going to 256 in the future. Um, that, again, continues to innovate this. The last design is just like the layer three ECMP design, but with VXLAN as the overlay, where you can stretch your layer two boundaries or your layer two domains using VXLAN as the overlay in cap decap format. And then we'll talk a little bit about the controllers as well. So massive scale, both on physical machines as well as number of VMs interconnected in a data center environment. And that's essentially what we do. So lessons learned over the last decade or so. Uh, number one, network redundancy is actually better than supervisor redundancy. No matter what everyone tells you, the contrary is actually not true based on our experience and our customers' experience. Number two, if you have the choice, layer three is better than layer two. Many customers who've gone with layer two networks have had issues. Layer three, it's unlikely that all four or all eight or all 16 ECMP devices have the same issue at the same time. So essentially in a layer three network, the network doesn't go down unless you have a massive issue like a power outage or something like that. But from a protocol standpoint, control plane standpoint, data plane standpoint, you just don't go down. Compute and apps, we've, have, we've had more of a sort of systems approach and, and whether you call it DevOps, the way we think of storage architectures and so on these days, there's a lot of innovation that's happened. However, networking to a great extent has been a box by box discussion. My blue box is better than your white box, but beyond that, it's still a box, and, and we've been limited to those discussions. We take a lot of pride in uptime. Instead of that, we should take, proud, take pride in minimal downtime. How we achieve it is what we need to focus on, not uh, that my legacy switch is still up for the last five years, and, and I cannot really upgrade the apps to new, get new features and so on. So lots of things happening. The way we upgrade networks, and you'll see some of this in demos today as well, so I won't go into a lot of detail just on this slide, but the world started with high availability and lots of talk about you know, per process SSO, per process fault containment and restart, uh, per process patching, per box config rollback. Now we have a sysdb based approach that uh, you'll hear in our architecture discussions as well where we can upgrade a pair of switches without any downtime. We have network-wide smart system upgrade as well as a network-wide rollback. And in fact, today you'll see a demo that shows you how we upgrade our switches without really dropping any packets. So lots of work happening over here. There's a lot of talk about automation. Automation, be it DevOps, automation, be it compared to the cloud, any new technologies you want to deploy. And there's lots of things you can do via automation. It could be the initial provisioning, it could be monitoring, it could be even as much as decommissioning and migrating your workloads. And decommissioning type of things, we don't really talk about them as much. But if you're a company that depreciates over a three-year life cycle, a third of your infrastructure gets decommissioned every year. So there's lots of things that's, uh, that are important here. If you look at an impact of automation and where the world is headed, initial provisioning, integration, change control, you have very high impact to the business when you automate these things. Monitoring, especially at small scale, is low because in the end you still have to go debug irrespective of how you got the alert via SNMP and other ways and so on. Replacement of products, it at scale or with remote hands, it is beneficial, but otherwise, hopefully the product quality is good, and as a result, this is not a big deal. Migration and decommissioning are again related to scale and how you <coughs> achieve this. Now, how we upgrade our networks. Today, you schedule an outage window for two hours or so. You have your change control and you go ahead with that. 
What we do with Smart System Upgrade, SSU, is you have a leaf spine design. And for the spine where we have network redundancy, we can now take advantage of that and play games with BGP route metrics and let the spine advertise a cost metric of infinity and not receive any packets, and then you can upgrade. So this is already available to our customers, where we can upgrade one spine at a time without really dropping any production traffic. <coughs> the same approach gets used for the leaf as well. And how we do it for the leaf, you'll see in the demo, how we upgrade our control plane while the data plane is still forwarding packets on the leaf switch, even when you don't have redundancy on the top of rack. This is not two top of rack switches. There's a single top of rack switch, one CPU, no VMs, no tricks, but we still do a full upgrade. If you look at how this has evolved and benefited our customers, we've gone from a standard reload. A standard reload takes about uh, three to four minutes to a very fast reload, which could be as much as a minute, to a, a hitless reload, which is now 17 milliseconds of data plane impact. And this, on a per switch basis, automated network-wide is what gets the customer the benefit of minimizing their downtime and be more cloud-like so that they can compare themselves to a Microsoft Azure or a Google or an Amazon and say, I also have high uptime. But for the hitless upgrade, like what can you actually do or accomplish in that upgrade? What can you do? Yeah, you know, are you upgrading? Like what are you, is it, is it a system upgrade? Like an OS image upgrade or, it's a full or OS a patch update? Or? It's a full OS upgrade and there is no N minus one, N plus one compatibility matrix. It's from any to any. There's no dependency between the releases. So I guess like when would you want to use the top two or you know, not use the hitless reboot? I, th I think once the world gets used to hitless, there should be no reason for any other upgrade. Okay. The, the third one is clearly better. Right, right. And it's a, yeah. it's a full upgrade. It's not a patch. It's not as if some stale state is left from the previous OS, none of that. Let's talk a little bit about monitoring and integration into the ecosystem. When you look at Arista as a company, we deliver great products for data center switches, layer two, layer three, lots of speeds and densities, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, optics, really good operating system. But at the same time, from a customer standpoint, the data center consists of several apps, certain use cases, be it security, be it load balancing, be it how they're virtualizing, how the VMs are moving, could be storage. We have partnered with a very broad ecosystem of companies, and you'll see some of these demos today as well. And, and this is fairly unique because we believe in building the best of breed stack for our customers. Rather than giving them an end-to-end -end solution that may not be the best, but they get sort of locked into that. So our, our value proposition is best of breed um, on technology and partnering with the right companies and getting that full ecosystem delivered to our customers, including uh, companies like VMware, uh, Microsoft, uh, Palo Alto, F5, HP, and so on. The eAPI ecosystem, which is our JSON-based API on our software, has evolved quite a bit. There are other companies that have been writing to our libraries. So if you go to GitHub, there's this lots of code now available for Arista EOS and Python libraries. Spotify re recently released something themselves as well. We integrate with Sev1 from a monitoring standpoint for our customers. Inmon is uh, a standard tool our customers use for S-flow-based monitoring that we directly connect into as well, and, and there are many more. Um, here's question, an on that, question on that. Can I ask now, or should Absolutely. I hold things off? No, no, go ahead, ask now. If I recall, I think you're still sending commands through eAPI. You know, is that going to evolve to be you know, more object-oriented over, over time? Sure. So um, I can answer that at a very high level, but okay. when Ryan talks about the SDK, okay. you'll realize what we're doing. Uh, uh, you can think of it this way, that uh, simple monitoring commands um, that if you want to send maybe one per second and so on, while JSON is great. Every command we have is supported via eAPI as well. So you get exactly the same response, but in a more structured format. And then if you want something very high transaction rate um, that is reliant on the, the control plane to share lots of route, routing entries and so on, we talk about the SDK okay. and how we do that. Here's how we take Arista EOS and stream all our data into a telemetry app um, and feed it into a Splunk collector. And uh, this was actually written by Lincoln Dale, who is right in this room. Um, on, on the right side, you can see that every dot is a network device being monitored, and you can click on it, look at all the details, what's going on in the device as well. So all of this is being fed from our switches into Splunk. So if you're already using Splunk, 
you can just absorb this data and we have a Splunk applet you can download and install to get you all of the graphics and the, and the views as well. So very simple integration of EOS into modern world tools rather than just being limited to legacy SNMP. We of course support SNMP, but we also support everything else over here. Do you have packages for other syslog collectors as well? We have packages. Uh, and, and I mean, already built. I mean, like, Splunk, like the Splunk one, or is it something that I'm going to have to create myself? If I get the, if I get the data, right. do I need to go off and build my own dashboards and or right. you so, have canned so version? We, we talk a little bit about Cloud Vision. There's a lot of integration we're doing with Cloud Vision where there are pre-integrated um, apps already available. And some of it is monitoring tied to visualization of data. Some of it is related to how change control is managed today. So for example, okay. we, we can integrate with Remedy. Okay. Or if you're using, uh, one customer is using, using RT. So any, any of these homegrown tools that people have built on, we integrate with that as well. And many of these applets are already available. If you go to our, our, our EOS Central website or GitHub, there are more than, I would say 200, 250 okay. uh, apps or extensions available today. Let's talk a little bit about white boxes. Since you're here in the valley talking to all of us, I'm sure there's curiosity and interest as well. Uh, the way we look at white boxes is essentially it comes down to what is the software model. And it's all about programmability and control. In our view, there are four ways to do programmability in networking. One of them is a high level API where you have the full stack, the hardware, the kernel, the HAL layer, the hardware adaptation layer, the platform code, protocol infrastructure, more protocols, the CLI, SNMP layer, and then monitoring on top. <coughs> you can integrate with XML or JSON. We call that programmability. The second approach is you integrate directly with the hardware, aka OpenFlow. But then you don't leverage the rest of the stack. But if you leverage the entire stack, you get visibility only at a high level, not every, everything in the stack. And there's yet another approach, which is you just integrate with the kernel. And of course, I can say the kernel does everything. That's not completely true. We have 7 million lines of code in EOS, not counting the kernel, which is all living over here. There's a lot of IP, there's a lot of state, a lot of features that are available to our customers for a reason. And you really can't take advantage of that if you're li living just off of the kernel. The kernel is great to get visibility into interfaces and so on, but not for code BGP or not for pushing code routing state or VRF state or VXLAN state into the kernel. So these are, of course, three ways of doing programmability. And many companies talk about these. The fourth type is a database approach. This is what we do at Arista in our operating system. We call it EOS, the extensible operating system. And there's lots of attributes of the product but this is the architecture of EOS, where we have a kernel, we have an efficient publish-subscribe model with a database, a SysDB, a system database that stores all the state. And we use this database to reflect or update every agent running in user space with that state. There are more than 110 agents running on the switch, each for a different purpose, each for a different feature. And via the publish-subscribe model, we can scale to millions of updates per second and achieve really great reconvergence in routing as an example, or, or partitioning of development of work, and as Ken will talk about, how we achieve great quality with our products as well. But in addition to that, we can also have the customer's code running on the switch. That's what Ryan will talk to you about today. And that's how you achieve programmability to your point, where you can actually write something at a very high transactional rate within the switch itself. It could be in C++ or it could be in Python, depending on how you want to optimize your code, but runs natively on the switch. Today, that's true programmability. That's true control. Yeah. And that's why some of the largest cloud companies on Earth that are great customers of Arista, they talk to us more about our features and APIs and the SDK, less about white boxes, right. because to them it's all about control. And today, some of our key customers who have talked openly about the use of these uh, APIs or frameworks with Arista products on YouTube and other videos, you'll see it, you, you can hear them as well. Uh, these companies are taking more control into their own hand. As a result, when we give the customer the right control and the right price performance, then they worry less about sort of white box because initially, it was look like price, but in the end, it's actually more about control, especially the cloud guys. They do things at scale, so it's always been how do they get more control. Can you go back one slide? I haven't spent too much time 
you know, recently looking at SysDB. Yes. So when you're making the change, you know, it can be via the CLI, it doesn't matter what it is. Are you directly communicating to SysDB or, you know, when you're making a BGP change or is it like that daemon then communicating it back to like SysDB and to persistent storage? Like what's the communication flow? Sure. Uh, Ken, do you want to answer that? You, you may want to come here. Or, or I'll leave it to Ken when he comes here. So he's mic'd up as well. And yeah, so. I'll, I'll wait too, but I think it's architecturally for Cloud Vision to understand that basic concept Perfect. will help yep. going forward. Absolutely. Let's do this in your section. We'll talk about the communication. But uh, there is generally an agent in the front. You don't connect directly to SysDB. So who is Arista? You've seen our campus. You've been here um, roughly every two years or so. We're very proud to have you back. And we've grown as a company every time you've come here uh, to meet us. We build data center switches. Lots of products, 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. We have the world's highest density in our products already today, and we've been ahead in the, on the curve with next generation products. We, were, we are one of the founding members of the 25 and 50 gig consortium, along with Google and Microsoft. And from an operational characteristic, despite how many products we have with different silicon chipsets on them, there's one operating system that runs on all our products. <coughs> not just one version, not just one train, one binary image that works on all our products. So it's easy to certify, it's easy to use. And that's a huge OPEX saving for the customer because the features are the same, the protocols are the same. They're exactly the same code. Every bug you see on one platform will exist on the other one as well. Of course, I'm, I'm just joking, um, <laughs> but, but that's a true sign of having the same binary image on every product. We'll talk a little bit about Cloud Vision. Jeff Raymond will talk about this topic to you. We are taking our SysDB approach and now doing it network-wide. So now there's a network-wide database as well that you can use to automate, that you can use to integrate, that you can use to monitor your network that has not been done in the past uh, in, the, in our space. So lots of automation coming and going from the per-box state to the per-network state. Orista today has this number two market share in 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig data center switching in the world. We have grown significantly since you were here last time to now roughly 12%, over 12% market share in our space. And, and we've been competing against heavily against Cisco and continue to do so um, as, as you see us in the market. Lastly, we have grown our support framework quite a bit for our customers globally. We have, uh, of course, tax centers in many parts of the world for a uh, good 24 by seven follow the sun model. But in addition to that, we have more than 100 RMA depots for our customers uh, globally. And, and every dot here represents an RMA depot location. These are available on our website as well. And, and uh, these are two hour or four hour replacement parts that we carry around the world for our customers. We have more than 3,300 customers today in 70 countries. <coughs> That's the scale at which we operate. <coughs> 